GM friends, and welcome to the Metacast brought to you by Navic. My name is Nico, and today is a develop episode. So uh, we are at Develop in Brighton, and I have Steve and Harry with me from Magic Cave. Um, and today we are talking about what Magic Cave is doing, who Steve and Harry are, um, and what innovative things they are using the blockchain for. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's conference time. It's really hot here. We have uh, gin and tonics. We're having a good time here. And um, yeah, let's dive in. So um, yeah, maybe first talk a bit about yourself. Who are you? And then we can go into what Magic Cave is all about and doing. Okay, so my name is Steve. Uh, happy to be here. Thank you, Nico. Uh, I am a game designer. I've been a developer for about 20 years. My time in the blockchain space has been intense and uh, full of lessons and stories, which I guess we will get into in a few minutes' time. Um, and I do loads of things. I do uh, a radio show called One Life Left, so I should be perfectly at home in this situation. Nice. Uh, we'll see. I, I <laughs> we also <laughs> I do uh, I do a thing called Marioki. Um, I'm a writer. I do talks at conferences, uh, and I try and make beautiful, tight, small games. Uh, and I'm also creative director at Magic Cave with Harry. Yep. So I'm Harry. Uh, I'm the CEO of Magic Cave, and uh, formerly a game programmer, and and more recently in the last sort of twenty years or so, running game companies involved in console games, PC games, mobile games, and now blockchain games. Exciting. So you guys have have seen it all. Um, been in the space for a while. So, talk to me. What is what does blockchain bring to you that you is this is this like the the, the question you get the whole time or the I mean, contra- controversial one? What does blockchain bring to me? It brings yeah. an, an enormous number of headaches, some anxiety, <laughs> you know, sleepless nights, all kinds of things. Um, I guess that's a really interesting question because that's where I started and where Magic Cave started about a year ago when Harry and I were talking about what we wanted to do and we could, you know, we had lots of different ideas that we were working on and then Harry suggested working in blockchain and I was appalled, absolutely, <laughs> like um, uh, taken aback and was like, absolutely not, I don't want to do anything like that because I'm on Twitter and therefore, <laughs> and therefore I know what these things are because I, I you know, I'm part of the indie gaming space on Twitter. I have lots of uh, friends there who I love, who hate blockchain and hate the space. And um, sometimes when you make your mind up about something, it's not that you're lazy, but you there are people you love and respect and you take their opinions as, as your own. And that was kind of where I was until I went out for dinner with a friend and um, I said, you know, I'm getting some approaches because it wasn't just um, Harry who was talking to about it. I had another friend who was really interested in me working on something, which I'm sure we'll get to as well. Um, And my friend said, you know, what are you doing at the moment? I said, well, lots of people want me to get involved in um, stuff to do with blockchain and I don't want to because it's all a scam. And he just thoughtfully sort of leant back and took a sip of his drink. Mm -hmm. And then he said, but what if you didn't do a scam? (laughs) And that kind of then put the pressure back on me because obviously the answer is, well, that's impossible to a point, but I couldn't rigorously defend that to someone who said that. I I don't know. I only know what people have told me about the space. So I went away and looked at what was interesting to me about the blockchain. I knew nothing about it at all. Like I knew people were selling monkeys for ridiculous amounts of money and things to do with that. And I, I, I I didn't get it, but I went away and looked at what was interesting about the chain to me. And that, um, again, I don't want to sort of like suddenly dovetail into the pitch for magic cave here. But for me, the interesting thing was two, uh, were two things. Firstly, the sense of uniqueness, ownership of an item that could be provably yours in a way that the whole community was buying into. Almost I don't care about the, the technical stuff behind that, but I care that there is this conceit that we're all saying now. We all agree that this item is yours and it belongs to no one else and it can be yours. And that felt special. Like other people can position that as a kind of selfish thing. You own it and no one else gets to. And that is true. But the flip side of that is, you know, this thing is personal. It, it can be yours. No one has my cat right? Like my, I have two cats at home, so no one has either of them. Uh, and they are uniquely mine and they would not feel, you know, I had a friend who had a Sony Ibo. It's very difficult to care about the Ibo because you know, a million other people own the Ibo and it's exactly the same. But the fact that this thing could be uniquely yours, that felt 
important to me as a designer. And the second thing was the transactional element, the theater behind taking an item from somewhere inside a game and being able to put it somewhere else. And I don't mean this kind of first order like thought of going, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could use a, a gun from Halo in an Ubisoft game or whatever, which I don't believe in and I don't believe is ever going to happen. But I do believe that I t that idea of taking a thing that I own, for example, um, I think back to my time with playing Animal Crossing, like I loved Animal Crossing a lot. And now that's sort of decayed and gone. Like, I mean, I play the new one as well, but the old one, this village that I cared about, the idea that I could have taken that out and put it somewhere that was mine, in a wallet or on a shelf or somewhere, and just knew that thing was mine, that feels special. And that moment of being able to bring something from here to there, again, regardless of whether that is theatre, well, sorry, no, but fictional, it is theatre. Us all believing in that theatre makes that feel interesting and new to me as a designer that gave me two tricks to play with and as a designer all i do is build things from tricks right none of this is real so yeah that's when i started to get excited about what i could do with the tech and that's what this is about really it's about the tech not the sector so much mm -hmm. but the tech that underlines it and where that might take I don't want to say gaming because, again, that leads everyone to believe that it's like about building new models and putting NFTs in people's games and doing that. But where that tech could have a place in gaming in five years' time, I think. That was a long answer to it. It was a great, great answer. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, how about you, uh, Harry? I think for me, it was, it, it was thinking back, even to when I was at university, which was a long time ago, and, and which was kind of in the, certainly the pre-web days. And, and I remember one of our, our lecturers, who's now Dame Wendy Hall, telling us about this project for uh, connecting together the world's information. And, and we, we, were, we were learning about hyperlinks and all of this kind of thing. And I remember kind of thinking at the age of 20 or something, what was the point of that? I don't, I don't see the use of that. And obviously, yeah, pretty predictable answer, but that became the World Wide Web, right, that project. And... And sort of, you know, I, I was involved in some sort of fairly early internet companies around the kind of dot-com boom time and seeing the change from, you know, sort of 92, 93 internet to the 99 internet when everyone was on it and then to the 2010 internet when everyone was on mobile and, see, you know, sort of seeing that the paths that weren't clear in 1992, you know, the, the, the young me thinking, well, what's the point of connecting together all the world's information to it now being so obvious why you want to connect together the world's information. It felt a little bit like this could be another one of those, basically. And, you know, I remember being, I guess now, what, 27, 28, and, and, and having companies that were involved in internet and gaming and, and, and people, you know, dismissing it as a fad and not seeing the use cases and saying, you know, talking about how slow the download speeds were. And of course, no one's ever going to be able to download a CD-ROM game over the internet because it's going to take forever. And all of those kind of things just resonated with me as, yeah, these things take a long time, but the changes happen. And, and I think that, you know, the, the, the changes that blockchain or blockchain like things can, can do for our industry and other industries are potentially as seismic as those. And, and I wanted to really just create something that can learn. You know, we don't know anything yet about what this space means, just like I didn't know anything in 1991 about what the internet was going to become. But you want to learn. And so, you know, really my original goal with Magic Ape was can we put together a team of curious people that are sort of, you know, one step at a time building a company and building products that, that are going to be in this space we're going to learn lessons as we go and we're going to make mistakes but we're going to you know we're going to make something cool on top of that technology whatever that technology becomes okay so and and so what are you building now hmm. well okay <laughs> so our interest is um is in physicality uh or in pseudo physicality <laughs> And actually, when we were pitching to investors, sometimes this got a bit confusing because people were like, are you building physical things or, 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 or digital things? And the answer is we're building digital things which feel as physical as they possibly can and use those tricks that I've already talked about to feel more real, to transfer that sense of ownership um, and physicality to a player or, or to an owner of one of our assets. What we're building are toys. Um, 
and around those toys that we build, which could be anything, and we're building something right now, which we'll get to. Uh, but around those toys, we build a layer of games that those toys can be used in and are kind of like suggested use cases for those, uh, for those toys. But they're not the only use case. What we are selling are the toys and we're also allowing our toy owners and anyone else to take our SDKs and build anything they want with those toys. So to me, the best analogy is, well, it's, it's, it's toys, right? Like, so you buy a matchbox car and you buy some track and you can, you're intended to sort of race that around and do a loop the loop and see how fast you can do that. But actually you end up driving it around your living room or you end up like throwing it out of the window and seeing how far you can or deconstructing it or painting it or doing anything else you want with this toy. And we don't care. We want other people to build use cases that other people will see and go, oh, that's a cool thing to do with my toy. Can I use your game you've built or can I just do my own versions? All these forked off futures from our toy. Um, and the analogy that I use all the time is, is Lego in that when you buy a set of Lego, you get a, a, a dinosaur or something to build on the box and people build that dinosaur. And some people, that's all they ever do, and that's fine. So the games that we are building, are, are I don't want to downplay them. They're not demos. They're really, really important to our ecosystem. We want them to be successful and brilliant games that people want to play on their own right, in, in their own right. But some people will play them and go, that's cool. I want to do my own thing. Like they take a Lego set and go, that dinosaur's cool, but what if it had, you know, fangs over here or three legs or, you know, an extra tail or whatever, build that thing. And some people will do something completely different with that, and that's fine. That's more interesting to me than traditional game development where you build a toy, you build a game, and people move through it and kind of exhaust it, and maybe they uh, maybe they you know go down this side road or they play all of these extra missions, but ultimately the things, the rules that the developer has designed are exhausted. They can't do anything else with them. For us, it's like, yeah, here's an object. We define the physical characteristics and some potential use cases, and then other people play. And that's quite exciting to me, I think. It reminds me of a conversation I had a few weeks back um, with one of the people behind Zero X Park, mm -hmm. and they're building autonomous world and digital physics. Mm -hmm. And it's a bit more abstract than what you were describing, um, but they're essentially recreating physics that, as we know on this planet, limitations that create a environment in which you could be endlessly creative mm. within the context that they allow well, with the digital physics. And it sounds like you're doing something similar to that, where you're giving people the tools, you're giving them an environment to play within and do whatever, do whatever they want or can. Yeah, I think one of the things that Harry says a lot like is that we're building hobbies. So we're building kind of mini ecosystems where we define rules and we define frameworks for people to exist within them. But it's up to the community to really direct where that hobby goes. And it's up to individuals to define how they get involved with that hobby. So again, I am personally like super excited to see people play one of our initial games and just fall in love with that and never move out of that box. But you can't build a game for everybody. You can't build a toy for everybody. And nor should you be arrogant enough to assume the things that you build with this thing are the best thing ever. I love the modding community, right? I love what they do with video games. And I love how they take games and genuinely make them better. It doesn't mean the developers originally are terrible at all. It means they are human and they can't exhaust every possibility or think of every possibility. But by building toys that we allow other people to build with, we're essentially, hopefully, accessing the creativity and kind of game design knowledge of, of people who are just as smart as, you know, our team. It's this um, 100,000 or a 10, like 100 million monkeys. If you put them on the typewriters and let them type endlessly, they'll come up with things like one, the work of Shakespeare, but also, you know, pieces of art that would have never existed. I mean, it. isn't that all modding and all, all social media and TikTok, isn't that like, everything that mm -hmm. yeah there's so much content created and sometimes it's not the things that you expect to succeed that do and often it's someone making something that's bad but has something in it a spark that inspires someone else to do that and build and build and build and build and that's the kind of community and creativity we want to encourage um but again like if people don't want to engage with that and just want to play the games we make 
that's cool too because a lot of people just want to buy the Lego set and build the Lego. That's why that's why they build it. For some people, uh, the idea of oh, just do anything that's terrifying. I don't want to do anything. I want to build the dinosaur? So build the dinosaur. That is not a bad way of having a good time. Totally. And so, could you you make this a bit more practical? So, what should we think? Like, what toys are you building, and you know, what will people be able to do initially within like the games that you provide? Harry, do you want to answer that? Because I feel like I'm talking sure. all the time. <laughs> okay. So, so the first thing we wanted to do was, was um, build something that's that's kind of small, but that is potentially infinitely expandable and, and can sit at the heart of. Yeah, you know, as he said, I, I bang on about hobbies a lot and. You know, to me, a hobby, you know, you take something like cars, right? You can be into cars, but what does that mean? Does it mean you're into fast cars? Does it mean you're into taking old cars and, and, you know, doing them up? Does it mean you're into decorating them? Does it mean the social aspect of those cars is important? All those different things that appeal to different people. And that's kind of what we wanted to be able to build. Um, but you've got to start somewhere. And at the heart of what we're building um, is dice. We, we loved the idea of dice as a as kind of the soul of, of, of this product that we're creating. Dice can be really beautiful things. I mean, we, we've sort of started to engage with artisan dice community. There are people that make these incredibly intricate, beautiful dice, um, you know, and, and they're, they're real items of beauty. They're unique things, that physical things that people are making. Uh, and of course, you know, you use dice to play a lot of games and, you know, the random aspect of dice is kind of cool. Um, so, so the first thing we're doing is, is, is launching dice um and we've built technology that allows us to kind of craft these incredibly beautiful handcrafted things that feel precious and wonderful and unique to you and have traits that that somehow relate to the way they might behave or the impact they might have in a game um and then we're starting to build a hobby around that so if you think about the dice first the next thing that comes after the dice is the characters. So, you know, you can think of it a little bit like a hobby like Warhammer or Dungeons and Dragons. You know, you can go into a, uh, a Warhammer store or Games Workshop store and, you know, there's people that go in there and what they really are interested in is buying the figures, painting them, that kind of thing. I, when I used to play D&D, I was, I kind of liked that part of it, but I also, I was a sort of stats geek. I, I knew, you know, every magic spell and I knew every statistic that the fighters would have and the swords would have and that element of it. And I remember a friend of mine was the dungeon master and his big thing was creating the worlds and, you know, bringing people through that narrative. And other people were really into kind of the performance aspect. It's almost like a, you know, a, a drama performance that's going on when people are playing these games. And I think all of those things can kind of come together. So so we're building something called D-Number, which is akin to that. It's not Dungeons and Dragons, it's not Warhammer, but it's in that space. Um, the dice, the characters, and then what we call the tiles, and the tiles are used to build worlds. And there are games that make use of all of these things. And all of these things exist on a blockchain. So you, you own them and you, know, you can build other things with them. You can take them and do whatever you want. We're providing SDKs so that people can not just you know, interact with the things that we make, but build their own games in Unity or Unreal or ultimately whatever game engine or, or metaverse may, may succeed in the future. Um, and so that's what we're building. And it, we're doing it in public. We're doing it, everything is kind of on our Discord. So you know, rather than taking the approach that sort of traditionally in games we've taken, which is kind of you know, keep everything under wraps for three years, and ta-da, here's the, here's the big AAA game we're making. We're going to show you this, the, the games that we're making from the point where they're these really simple 2D test beds, which you know, people can already see, um, all the way through to them being these beautiful 3D things that we're now starting to, to just show people a little, a little glimpse of. And so what are the, so you were first creating dice, mm -hmm. which are these beautiful objects that feel real. And because also you can, take them out of their natural context, they are yours. Um, what are the first things that they'll be able to be used for? So the, there are a few different games that we're building internally right now. Um, one of them is a very, very simple roller. So it is a, uh, a dice tray, which you can take your dice and you can take any combination of your seven dice that you buy and you can roll them. Uh, and you can roll multiple ones of them. And of course you could use that for D and D, if you wanted, or you can just use it to show yourself that you have bought an item rather than a JPEG or a movie or anything like this. It is a 3D item that has some kind of practical purpose, and that practical purpose is dice, just like you would have. That's not enough, right? But it is something to again sell the physicality of this item. Mm -hmm. um, 
there'll be um, a playful, simple game called Dice Goblins, which is kind of uh, a deck builder, uh, more like a dice builder, uh, versus cards that represent goblins, and you roll numbers to uh, defeat those goblins. It's a very, very short demo version. But the bigger game that we're building out right now is a thing that we are... Well, it doesn't have a title, the internal title, which as I know from game development, will swiftly become the external title <laughs> and will be called this forever until unless someone makes a decision pretty quickly. And they have to, because I'm not super keen on this. Uh, it's, it's internally called HexGen. And what it is, is a classic roguelike. So one of my personal bugbears in game development is that um, people use the term roguelike a lot, uh, which means originally means a game like Rogue. But now these days means... Uh, it's a bit hard. It's, it's got <laughs> you die. some. You die. It's got some. It's got a lot of grinding in it, and it's kind of got some. Probably got some procedural generation in it, which I think is fine, right? And I love a lot of those games, but I also think the draw of Rogue, the original Rogue, and the games that have built on that is kind of bigger. So we're building a Rogue like uh, traditional Rogue like with elements of other games uh, in there as well themed around this universe that we're building as well, this D-number universe, whereas where at the heart of the universe is this element of captured fate, of dice spinning at the heart of all of us. We cannot control everything, but we do our best anyway. Um, that's the universe. I like the fact that you're starting with dice because they feel like the perfect primitive mm. that you can use <laughs> Literally to, primitive. to do anything to generate RNG. And, you know, I might be wrong, but it also feels like I remember that dice were almost the first games that people, mm -hmm. humans used to play with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you can so, find on, like, on our Discord, sometimes people post, like, Roman dice and uh, yeah, those yeah. kind of, like, really, really early versions. But, of course, it's a really, really good fit for us because, as Harry said, our intention is to learn. And we know that doing this, we will fail uh, because that's part of learning. If you meet someone who hasn't failed, then I don't believe they've been learning. They've just been lucky. And so we build these dice and we, we choose dice because they're simple, right? They're literally, well, I was going to say they're literally primitives, but if you talk to our artists, they're definitely not primitives. Yeah. They're very God. complicated. How, how hard can it be? It's just a polygon. <laughs> Write a number on it. Yeah. Bosh. Done. Turns out it's really hard. Yeah. Uh, but it is a good, it's genuinely a good place to build that 3D technology from, right? Because you're building, uh, like I said, these toys, you know, years down the track for Magic Cave will be anything but you don't want to start with a car because there's many more moving parts than there are with what is not quite literally a primitive. Okay, so you're going to start with, um, would I would it be correct to call them like the Dungeons and Dragons primitives where you have the dice, the characters, tiles that represent location, and then... I mean, you can call them that, but it's probably trademark, so I wouldn't. Okay. Like, <laughs> it's it's in the D&D sort yeah. of world, right? Yeah. And we love those games. We love Warhammer. Uh, yeah. and it's a big demographic, and there are plenty of other skews of that. So, yes, D-Number is targeted, or, sorry, HexGen, and other games around that D-Number universe generally targeted at that space. Yeah. But that isn't to say all of the games that we are going to release and other humans make because they're just dice you can make whatever and um the good thing about you know the way we operate is there's nothing to stop us doing little internal game jams kicking stuff out in front of the community and it could be you know a basic game where you just throw dice at a wall and the numbers that come up define who wins or who loses yeah, that's yeah well yeah. quite we can we can build that someone else can build that and we hope they they do mm -hmm. um and we will be able to front page those, bring those to the community through our Discord and through other means as well. So, yeah, while we are targeting for our our first uh, major game, that sort of sphere, it doesn't limit the dice to that world. Okay. So building games is hard. It is. Um, if you can get thousands of people building games within your ecosystem, there's there's a fair chance that one of them will, you know, <laughs> crack the code and, and, and be successful. So... You know, let's say you build your own games and none of them, you know, really draw in big audiences to mm -hmm. kickstart that user generated content. What's the next step? How, how are you solving for that? Um, are you going to start like build games yourself or you, do you have other solutions in mind? I mean, we are building games ourselves. That's the plan. And as a game designer, you have to back yourself to say this game is going to be good enough to draw in the audience. Now, these games are not built in a 
Web 2 way, and not built in an old game development way where we just kick it out and go, oh, that one failed or that one succeeded. We're building them in full view of the community. And uh, the demo games that we build as well will be pushed out to them as well. And so some of them will succeed, some of them will fail. But if I didn't think we couldn't make good games and couldn't make a game that will attract an audience, you know, then I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be doing this and I wouldn't still be doing game design. I want to make things that millions of people love. And so we're not just building for the audience that's out there right now. You can, you'll be able to play our games without buying the dice, but the game has to be fun in the first place, right? Because otherwise, even if you offer it to someone for free, they're not going to play it. So that's our target. I mean, it's kind of a bullish answer, right? Your, your question is, what if you can't do that? And my answer is, we'll do that. Mm -hmm. Trust me. Yeah, sure. <laughs> because we, well, we may not do it first time, but we'll keep doing it and we'll be We'll and we, and by, by doing things in little chunks, you know, when we when we put out a game, it might be a game that's only been in development for a week. You know, it might be a genuinely a game jam situation. Doing something with, you know, whether it's with the dice or the figures or the tiles, something that is in that ecosystem. You know, for example, dice commons. You know, we're using the concept of of your fighting against cards, and one of the reasons for doing that, you know, what aspect? You know, we know that card battle games are cool, but what? You know what parts of that are going to be fun in our in our ecosystem? Maybe some of those mechanics make their way into. The bigger games, and maybe they don't. But but, but you know, it's, it's that those small things, learning what works, doing it in front of the community, seeing what do they like, what does you know, does that spur something, spur someone to go off and say, actually, I don't like that, but look at what I made, look at what I made over the weekend. Hmm. Um, I think that you know, just discovering what the hobby is. So so you know, right now it's quite feels unusual as a game developer the the amount of unknowns that we've got ahead of us. I mean, generally, <laughs> you you know. I think your know, game development's got a little bit more agile over the years, but I think you generally know what you're going to be building yeah. at the beginning. But I think, you know, I'd, I'd be very surprised if what D number is in two years time is exactly what we have in our mind at the moment. And that's one of the things that makes it super exciting. Hmm. How, what have you learned about building in public with like in constant communication with your community? I think it's early days for us. I mean, we haven't made a lot of effort to, to build a big community yet. Um, but what we are seeing is, I, th I think just an enthusiasm from people. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, I think communities are, they're very difficult things to create, but we, you know, we're, we're seeing, um, you know, people that are passionate about dice. And it was one of the things that we, we were interested in, you know, are people that like and make real dice, are they going to hate digital dice? But actually, you know, we, we're seeing people really getting into the idea. I think people are, are if you're, if you're not building these things, as he said, to be a scam, you're building these things to create something sustainable and something that people are going to love. They can see it as an extension of a hobby that they already love rather than a challenge to something that they're into. So, so I think that's what we're learning so far. And, and the feedback is nice. I think we haven't put, you know, we haven't put loads of playable stuff out there yet for people. So we'll, we'll find out in the coming months how, how that process works, I think, a bit more. Yeah, I mean, I've been involved in another uh, NFT project for six months and learned so much about the community and about building things for that community. And I, I guess one of the, I, I guess there are two main lessons for me. One is that you can't expect to build a thing and expect, uh, build a thing for games and expect that audience to be gamers who buy that thing. There's a lot of speculators in that audience who are buying things to sell them higher, which is, uh, you know, a good percentage of the people who are investing in NFTs right now, but it isn't everyone. Like the other community I, I've been involved with, I've genuinely been astounded at the base level of creativity and support that people have there. There are true believers, not in the financial world that exists right now, but in the world and the tech that will exist in uh, a few years time and are excited for what we're building and just build things on their own like genuinely take the thing which, which is not something you you do see people in games traditionally getting excited about ip right like like they love this world they love these characters they write fan fiction around them they mash them up they you know <laughs> But you don't often see people getting excited about the pieces, the individual things, the ownership, the object, like they do, like people do for objects they have in their houses, things they put on their shelves, things they have around that they want other people to see. 
and talk about. And that's what I've seen you know, communities engage in taking their objects and just loving them and wanting you to love them and provide op options for you as well, like provide options for them rather. So yeah, I think that the Web3 community is very creative at its heart. Like it's not just the financiers that people say it is. There's a lot of people who want to build and want to see exciting things in the future. Um, that's been, yeah, one of my lessons. The other thing that I've learned is that it's very, very important to show progress and to show what you're building and to allow people to engage in that to a point like people trust you uh, as long as they know what you're doing. And, you know, all of the projects that I'm involved in, I'm like, OK, that's a clear lesson. You engage people and you trust them to trust you as well. Very interesting. And so you are in your first iteration you will build dice and the number and a universe around that what are some of the ideas you have for for after that <laughs> so uh you mean uh within the dnum thing or beyond that? beyond dnum so anything really like there is so it's my true belief that um uh... It's such a boring thing to say. So you find yourself speaking in cliches a lot in this sector, but <laughs> one and and I bristle against some of them because some of them are used uh, strategically and poisonously. And one of the things you hear people say defensively all the time is, "We're early, right? We're oh, we're early. It doesn't matter. You know, you're you're early. You're early. Get in early. Get in early. Buy this thing because mm -hmm. you'll get rich." And most of that stuff is bullshit, right? Like, but. I wouldn't be here if I didn't think we were early in the sort of bigger vision of what blockchain can be and what this space can be. Yeah, sorry, I've run, I've so, run into a dead end. So the, th the things that could come after Dina, but other oh, hobby... Oh, sorry. Sorry, yes, that's where I was, I, <laughs> where I was going. Reboot. It's the gin and tonics. <laughs> so, yeah, um, we, we're making toys, right? Like, um, and... We truly believe that we are early in that sector and a sector that after the, you know, the recent sort of troubles, people are now like, okay, maybe this isn't the dream. Maybe this isn't the future we'll back away from. But if you are a company who stays in that sector and learns the lessons, then I think in four or five years time, toy manufacturers will all want to be in this space. They will all want to be creating digital facsimiles of where they are. Now, there is nothing in the technology that we are building right now, which, as I said right at the start, starts with dice, right? Uh, simple objects, but grows into anything that we want that can't stop us partnering with someone and building for them or with them and building anything we want with them. Now, I think it's trivial for us to say, oh, cool, yeah, we're building a car universe next. Oh, we're building a, a, a you know, a fighty fighty universe or we're building a sci-fi universe after that all of that would be bullshit like because we don't know where the space is going to be in three we don't know where the audience is going to be but i'm excited not about like where not about the audience right now but the audience in five years time when you're not spending you know some ridiculous amount of ethereum on this but instead you're spending 9.99 with a credit card and buying a toy and the audience is everybody it's it's everybody so maybe i doubt it but maybe that happens next year and maybe our second collection is care bears you know <laughs> you know our second collection is is ponies or a second collection you go where the audience takes you if you've got the right model mm -hmm. and I, th I think one of the things that's important to us is just the concept of scale so you know coming from the coming from sort of traditional game business in the in the 90s we thought it was a pretty big business. I worked at PlayStation when we, had, we did PlayStation 1, and I think we sold something like 120 million PlayStations around the world, and that was massive. But now, you know, there's 3 billion people playing games, and, and the, the sheer scale that the industry operates at now, and you compare that to the current scale of the blockchain but games business, it's probably less than a million people worldwide that have ever played a blockchain game. So you can see there's enormous potential to, for that to become, you know, a, a very, very big audience. But the, the process of actually playing a blockchain game and the enjoyment that most people get from blockchain games is minimal. You know, it's, it's very difficult and it's very minimal enjoyment. But you know, the challenge for us as an industry and us as a developer is, is you know, okay, we're here and we know where we want to get to and there's a whole bunch of steps to go through to get there. But the, the opportunity when you do get there, I think, is, is just phenomenal. Mm. 
And, and that, that's the exciting bit of this. And, and I know it's, it's become a bit of a cliche to say it's like the internet used to be, but it kind, <laughs> of, it kind of feels like it is. But it's also a cliche to say we're early, and that is certainly true. Like, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited about all of the universes we get to go and create. I just don't know which one we get to do next. Makes sense. So, you know, one of the problems I see in blockchain games today is that a lot of it is predicated upon scarcity and mm -hmm. speculation. Um, it intuitively, intuitively feels like if you're selling toys, mm -hmm. my enjoyment of my toys is not decided by whether, like, how rare my toys are. No. Um, is that correct? How are you thinking about, you know, your own business model? And would it be the same as traditional toys? Or how, do, how are you thinking about that? I think there's still some of that sort of speculation in traditional toys. You can get excited that you've got the rarer Pokemon Lego card. figure yeah. or Pokemon card or, or whatever, but we don't want our model to be, okay, you've got the rare one, you can sell you that win. for higher, you can, <laughs> yeah, or, yeah, or you win. Yeah. It's really, really important. Um, so uh, perhaps it's more useful to talk about one of the core mechanics of Hexgen, like the, the dice creating the characters. So all of our dice look different, right? And some of them look wildly different from each other, but you should always be able to look at your set of dice and say, yeah, that's mine because that's got that little thing on the corner of the D4, or that's the red swirly one with the gold lettering on this side of this dice. You should always be able to recognize your dice. Even when there are millions of sets of dice out yeah, there. Which is non-trivial to produce tech that we've to do that, but we have a brilliant, you know, uh, art team and I'm really, really proud of what they've done. Now, when you've got millions of things, the sort of rarity model becomes kind of weird, right? Like, because how do you, how do you skew that? Are a thousand dice still rare? Well, I don't know because you've got, um, you know, a, th a thousand of them out there. And again, do you want to get into a habit where someone really wants to beat the game? So they have to buy the thousand diamond dice. I want to be like that. So the way that fil filters into, um, into uh, Hexgen is this, you have your sets of dice and you have your standard sort of character, uh, what would you call it, like model with slots around it. And you drag those dice into the slots of the character. Now, depending on what your dice look like and maybe what set they're from, because we're going to release these in themed sets, uh, depending on what your dice look like, that will affect the stats of the character. So are we okay for the filming? Yeah, we should be. We should be? Okay. Yeah, we okay. Yeah. We'll fix it in post. <laughs> uh, so depending on um, so depending on where you place the dice in the structure of the of the character in the slots, you'll create a different character. So if I have a set of wizard dice, uh, and they're very specific wizard dice with certain stats, whatever, place these in the head and the arms and the chest, they will create a wizard. And if that's my only set of dice, that's the character I can create. Now, if I have a set of rogue dice, or if I have a set of, uh, you know, fighter dice, and start mixing and matching those, those create different character possibilities. None of these sets are better or worse than the others. They have different stats and they create different characters, and obviously huge variations based on the number of dice sets you own, which is kind of cool, I think. Every day, the game generates a different dungeon. Somewhere in that dungeon is an objective or several objectives. Somewhere is a piece of treasure like that there are limited numbers about, so you want to be the first to that treasure. If you have a certain type of character, it may be more challenging for you, but not impossible to get deeper in that dungeon. Uh, but you can roll up another character, create another character, and potentially mint that character as well. Or you cannot. You can just take the character you've got and enjoy that challenge. And so there's kind of a meta game there of designing the best character to get into the get this far through the dungeon but there is no perfect character because if you create you know a uh, you know a mage that's really good with fire magic and swimming in the water and come across some kind of ice dragon it might be your character is really powerful but this is not going to help you here so go back and re-roll that principle that i've described there maybe quite badly applies to the bigger picture of how the dice work because we design these games and define you know the, the qualities of the dice so it might read in the uh, texture or the, uh, the the material of the dice as the armor for the characters it may read the font as the class whatever but the bigger picture is harry can go away and jam out a game 
that makes all of the diamond dice in his game uh, become a fluffy cat pet. And none of the other dice do. And then suddenly, if Harry's game becomes super successful, then those diamond dice accrue, you know, become, have a value that is, you know, determined kind of by the community about which games are successful, which games we choose to front page and say, yeah, you're part of our universe. So there is kind of like a load of balancing there and, and making sure that, uh, that, you know, there's enough variation across the dice that if you've got one set that it's not just the most powerful, but it's good in this game and it's not so good in this game or it's interesting or whatever. Um, but I, 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 I'm not scared of that. I think it's super, super interesting and much more interesting than the traditional model in that space of, oh, you've got a good one. Cool. Well done, you. You were lucky. <laughs> I'll pay you loads of money for it. Like that's, you know, I don't think that's a sustainable model across this space. Um, and I'm completely trying to break that. Like, fascinating. Um, we are yeah around you know the time I want to um, round up these these episodes. What is where can people find more information about what you're building? A, a really complicated Discord URL. Like, <laughs> but if, if you go to uh, magiccave.io, there is a link to our Discord Perfect. from there, and it should be on the Twitter as well. Which yeah. is. And Magic Gabe is magic with A V E at the end. Yes. yes. That's right. Okay. Awesome. One completely, C. Only one C in Magic. Completely Cave. normal name that's definitely not going to cause us problems. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, absolutely not. Yeah. Yeah. Good. All right. Well, um, Harry and, and Steve, this was amazing. Um, I'm fascinated about what you're building and I um, I hope to see some uh, amazing experiences and at some point perhaps own some some pretty kick ass dice my, <laughs> myself. Um, so that's exciting. Um, yeah. Listeners, thank thank you guys for listening. I hope you enjoyed this. Um, develop is highly recommended. Brighton is pretty nice. It's good weather as well, so uh, that's that's great. Um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, let us know. Um, and if you want to join the conversation, you can find our Discord, the Navic Discord, and join us there. Um, and with that, we're out, and we look forward to speaking to you in the next episode. Ciao.